Hi, everyone. I hope you all have been enjoying the wonderful talks since morning. Are you? Wonderful. Well, I'm so grateful to the Yana Initiative for giving us this opportunity to sponsor them as well as speaking opportunity. So thank you so much, Diana Initiative, the entire community, as well as the AV team who have been great helping us since last 15 minutes to solve certain issues. So thank you guys, three cheers for you. Today, uh, my esteemed colleague Hossein and myself, we will be talking about how can we leverage software bill of material to improve the open source software security? Open source software is eating the world. Those who agree with me, raise your hands. Yes, and this is because, you know, the low cost at which the open source software is offered to us, as well as when we use open source component the speed of execution of implementing new services, as well as uh, you know, applications is so much faster than reinventing the wheel from scratch, right? Now imagine looking at these statistics, there is a critical vulnerability. You all can understand gravity of this unresolved security vulnerability, as well as its impact at scale. Let's take a look at a couple of those examples. Who remembers the Equifax breach from 2017? Raise your hand. Awesome, almost 50% of the crowd. So in 2017, Apache Struts server, which is a very open source component, it suffered a security flaw in their file upload functionality. Somebody could you know, upload uh, RCE, that is remote code execution, and steal information. As a result of this vulnerability exploit, almost 147 million people from US and America lost their personal information. In fact, the Federal Trade Commission, they said the settlement was almost 425 million. Now you guys can imagine impact of a simple security vulnerabilities in a real life world, right? I have one more example. Who remembers Heartbleed? It's from 2012, okay, more people. Yeah, I think because of the heart shape, many people remember it. It's definitely, you know, eye grabbing. So in 2012, OpenSSL suffered this vulnerability. On the eve of New Year 2012, a German developer accidentally introduced this buffer overflow flaw in heartbeat extension. And as a result, almost 66% of the sites and services were affected. Rest is history. It took weeks and months for security professionals like us to do the damage control. I hope you remember that. The third vulnerability I would like to speak is Log4j, which is relatively recent, December 2021. Who remembers that? Oh, all of you. Awesome. We all know that there was a remote code execution which affected millions of millions of Java-based application data stores and devices. And again, it took us weeks to do the investigation, the damage control and whatnot. Now that was about just three vulnerabilities, right? This particular data shows that 860 vulnerabilities were discovered that had CVSS rating nine to 10 in 2020. And this number was quite high uh, in 2021 as well, which is 532. Now imagine if we just take the reactive approach of mitigating, doing damage control of one critical vulnerability at a time, how far it can take us, right? Not very far. So in order to change the whole state of going from detection to more accurate detection, and to remediate these vulnerabilities at scale, what can we do? That's what the talk today is about. We are going to explore software bill of material and how they can help us to improve the overall state of uh, software security. This is a little bit about me. I am engineering manager of software security at Datadog. Uh, 
In past life, I was a mobile game developer turned product security professional. I'm always open for mentorship and coaching, and yes, my teams are hiring, uh, and I'm gonna be a little bit shameless about this. If you are interested in knowing more, uh, my colleague Elena is here, and Datadog booth is right outside. When I'm not doing security cryptography, I love to exercise. That helps me to keep the neurochemical tank full, helps me to deal with modern lifestyle stresses as well as, you know, uh, work. Uh, when I'm not exercising, I love to hike for recreation purpose, and I'm also a certified yoga meditation instructor, uh, so love to conduct meditation workshops. So I'm very big on work-life balance in case you want to talk about that afterwards. This is my contact information. Please send me email in case we don't get chance to talk today. Uh, add me on LinkedIn. I always love to connect with newer people. Hossein? Sure. Hello, everybody. This is Hossein Siadadi. I'm a senior security engineer at Datadog. Uh, previously, I was a software engineer at uh, Google working on software supply chain security. When I'm not working, um, I like hiking, swimming, and surfing. Of course, this is a Photoshop photo of me, uh, but I aspire to you know, practice uh, to become a good surfer. Thank you, Hossein. I love Hossein's picture while surfing, don't you all? Uh, so today, uh, we will talk about open source software security gaps and what are S-bombs, what's S-bomb tooling, and how they can really help us to improve the overall state. My esteemed colleague, Hossein, will also cover some of the other interesting use cases of S-bomb. What are the challenges he faced while generating S-bombs? Uh, and besides S-bomb, what are some of the strategic initiatives we have to keep in, in mind to improve the overall state of soft open source software security? And then towards end, 10 minutes, we have reserved for question answers. All right. Um, I just showed you three scary vulnerability that took away our few weeks as, as part of our soft, uh, security professional life, right? But if you zoom out, and focus more on the big picture, what are some of the gaps you see? The first gap that I have observed in my last 15 years of product security professional career is many open source software developers lack security education. Yes, they care very deeply about you know, usability, they care about performance, they care about scalability, but when it comes to security, Oh, it's the security team's responsibility. And when somebody is open source you know, software developer, do they have access to a top-notch security team? Maybe, may not be, depending on the organization where they work, right? If you look back to universities, at universities, many people skip the security class. Only those who are passionate about security, they take one class as part of elective. What I have observed is security is being not taught as part of you know, programming classes, database, or you know, other software engineering classes. It's not. So those who miss to take security class, they miss out on education. Now at Datadog, we have amazing security champions program to help our developers with the missed security education, right? But in other organizations, I'm not sure. So that's number one gap, lack of education. The second gap I have seen is we in industry rely on software composition analysis tool and they are still in their first generation. They do okay job of generating software bill of material, but they still miss a lot on vulnerability context. And when your findings are not meaningful, security engineers burn out just by doing false positive analysis. The third gap I have seen is almost 50% of the organization do not have open source software security policy or standard. And as a result, uh, the processes to upgrade your open source software to stay on top of it, those are just immature. The tooling or processes, they break your services when you do upgrades. They take your time to fix those regressions, right? So those are some of the gaps I have seen 
as part of open source software security. Now let's talk about the motivation of this talk. Uh, this topic is very near and dear to my heart. I think about it all the time. What can we do to improve this messy, complicated problem? So today, we are going to talk about how software bill of materials can help. Unlike many software composition analysis, which are analysis tools which are generated from source code, software bill of material can actually be generated from source code, build time, and run time. And as a result, we see a lot more accuracy. And then uh, we are going to end this presentation talking about some of the strategic initiatives. With that, I would like to hand over to Hossein to get into the world of software bill of material. Here you go, Hossein. Thank you so much, Tripti. Again, very glad to be here. Before I go to the uh, technical part of this presentation, I want to thank our mentor uh, for this presentation because, I mean, the story is that when we proposed this uh, talk, um, basically, um, we were given the feedback that we have to include some aspect of, like, more inclusion, open source, and, you know, provide, if we provide any tooling recommendation, it should be accessible to everybody. So in this talk, whatever we talk about is mostly accessible, and we are not going to mention any, like, commercial tool. Uh, but thank you to the Diana Initiative to assigning a mentor and guiding us through, you know, writing it, uh, giving it the right way. A warning, if you have heard of a spam, as there's going to be lots of spam, spam, spam in this presentation. But bear with me, uh, if we can make the right uh, connection, uh, have the right perspective, we're going to get something out of it, not only, you know, a bunch of data that are useless. Let me get started with a, a definition of a spam. Uh, there is a body of, you know, government work uh, under NTIA that they have prepared a very valuable set of documentation describing a spam and everything around that. I would encourage you to uh, basically read those documentations. But the core, the definition that they provide around the spam is that a spam is um, software bill of materials. is a nested inventory of software, a list of ingredients that make up software components. And this is, I mean, at the core, not something new. We have had this concept in the world of, you know, mechanical engineering in the past, 1960, or industrial engineering, uh, that for any sort of product, they would provide a diagram of a sort, and they would describe all the pieces in the details. What is the shape? What are the diameter? What are the, you know, uh, material? Anything around that. And the main purpose was to be able to diagnose the problem, if there is anything with the engine, for example, to see you know, what was wrong, wrong with what piece and then how this should be fixed. Uh, similarly, in the food industry, we see these labels on almost everything that it tells us some aspect of the ingredients of uh, a product that we are going to be using just in case somebody is allergic to some specific, uh, you know, chemicals, like a lot of people have allergies to peanut or any other thing. So these labels are going to help consumers to be cautious about, you know, the impact of the product that they're using. So the idea comes, like, it's kind of old. It's unfortunate that, I mean, in the software industry, it's just, like, recent emphasis on this. But again, uh, at least, you know, uh, good to have it. And we try to, you know, um, basically advertise and help people to get this right and help themselves and also their own customer. Uh, the definition that I provided in the previous slide, it just uh, gives you the list of the ingredients, but a spam is not only the list of dependencies, like the list of component that creates your software, but also it provides a context if you use it the right way. Uh, what I mean is that in addition to the name of the dependency or the library that your software is using, you would provide the author name in, in case you have to, for example, if you have a git commit or um, in, in your source code repository, you, if you want to contact someone to correct or fix a bug, you know where you have to contact. 
Otherwise, you know there is a problem, but you don't know how to fix it, and you are not the author of the software, so you have to be contacting the author or the owner of this piece of software. Supplier name, component name, obviously the version, like these are the two obvious ones when you talk about the list of dependencies, but the others are not, you know, obvious. Component hash, in case you want to uniquely identify a software piece, uh, unique identifier and the relation of this piece of software. You know, it's not only one level dependency, you could have a dependency that has a dependency. So this could be nested and you have to have a way of describing, you know, dependencies between these pieces of software. In addition, you can have licensing, which is important for a lot of uh, companies. So they don't end up using a piece of software which is not compliant with their, you know, regulations. Um, you can talk about timestamp, when this was created, end of life, grouping, and the provenance, where this software was fetched from. So all of this contextual information about dependencies of your software is gonna help you more and more um, to uh, basically be able to build all these use cases that I have described in this slide, and this is based on our research in our company. I have listed a lot of them, um, but the focus of this presentation is around, you know, vulnerability management and software supply chain security, but I uh, skim through them. So, in addition to the top two, that is going to be the focus of my presentation today, you can use the software bill of material because, you know, eventually you're going to have a database of inventories of, you know, what you have, what your software is composed of, where those components are, so you know where is every piece. You, you will be able to improve software development. You will be able to do software uh, chain management. You can do asset management. You can, it can help your uh, procurement. Uh, it can provide high assurance uh, processes and also intellectual property. So as I said, uh, the first three or first two are the highest priority in uh, my presentation around vulnerability management, how a spam and contextual information that it can provide. Of course, combined with some extra information that we can get through, you know, data, databases of vulnerability can help us. Uh, and the software supply chain security, which is, you know, the entire picture of, you know, your software supply chain um, uh, can be, can, uh, can be achieved using a spam and contextual information. But before, uh, going further, uh, let's see what actually, uh, how the spam uh, gets uh, surfaced in, in the lowest layer, uh, basically. Um, so let me go over one specific example, and then I'll talk about the standards here. So imagine that you have a software called Infusion that has four dependencies, and one of them has another dependency, and one of those dependencies are Java, and then there's a Tomcat 9, and then you have a Spring framework, which by co-accident, uh, a few months ago, there was a, a Spring 4 um, shell vulnerability as well, uh, for example. So the software bill of material can describe this uh, structure in a machine-readable information, kind of describe what is the core software, what are the dependencies and different levels of dependency, and also it could include the uh, vulnerability information. So you can describe those information as you wish. You know, it could be a JSON file that with your own format, as you wish, you could put this information in a relational database format with a description. Uh, but also there's a standard, specifically when it comes to exchanging this information between companies. Like if you provide a piece of software that is gonna be used by a third party company, you have to use a standard. And these two standards, SPDX, um, and DX stands for data exchange. Um, 